Good morning, everyone. It's great to see the chat room fill up. Uh, we're really pleased that you could be with us today because I know Saturdays are pretty uh, uh, special days, and uh, we are really happy that you're with us here today. My name is Lorna Costantini, and I'm pleased to co-host today's show with Kim Case and Peggy George, our faithful uh, co-host is uh, enjoying some time with her family. She's in North Carolina. So we're going to wish her well for the day. And I want you all to know that makes, makes it harder for you because you have to type and fill in for Peggy. Because I said to some people, I'm a terrible typist. But I'm here in St. Catharines, Ontario. And Kim is uh, in San Antonio, Texas. And our special guest today is Dan Mayer. And the topic is math class and how math class needs uh, make over. We do have a great supporter in the chat room, and that's Tammy Moore. And we always like to send out a shout out to say thank you, Tammy, for providing closed captioning for the folks in the chat room. So let's get started, folks. How many people are new today? You figure out where that green check is down the bottom. And if you are new, just give me a, a signal with a green check. Oh, great, so a few people. I'm going to clear that. How many people have used Illuminate before? So a green check if you've used Illuminate. OK, we have a few people who haven't. Uh, you know, we hope that you had a chance to go through the Getting Started video. But if not, I'm going to give you a really fast tour of the interface with Illuminate. So just take a quick look here. We figured out here the green check and red X to vote. There will be open mic time later on. And that's raise your hand over here if you have a mic and you're available. We really need to have your USB headset because uh, we'll get feedback if you don't. If that's the case, then if you don't have a headset, just type your question in the chat and you raise your hand. But Kim's really good at moderating questions, and she'll be doing that in a few minutes. Uh, I think you're finding out sending messages in the empty field here. Send your comments, and we have lots of great discussion between yourselves and the presenter. Send it in there. Click send to make sure it's. Uh, designated as this room. Coming to the mic, you have to actually make the mic access work. So down the bottom left-hand corner is the microphone. So click it on, becomes yellow and active. And when you're finished talking, please click it off. Um, I'm going to ask you to use the uh, whiteboard tools in a minute, and specifically the laser pointer, which is just about here, a blue wand with the red starburst, because you're going to show us where you are located in the world. Um, that's a quick about the interface. A couple of things about notifications, because you might be hearing a sound ping every time someone goes in or out of our session, or you see that pop-up window. If that is a bother for you, then you can turn that off. Simply go to the menu in your uh, browser for Tools, and go to Preferences, and you'll see either audio notifications, and you've got a lot of options here that you can enable or disable as you feel necessary. And the same thing applies. Oops, we miss, missed one here, the visual notifications. The same thing applies. So just go through the preferences under Tools and select what you wish to have happen for your experience today. So I don't think we're doing app sharing, so I'm not going to pass that one. But here's a really important thing. We do have a website. If you're not familiar with this, it's live.class120.com. And the complete Illuminate recording, uh, MP4, uh, chat logs, and audio file are available shortly, if not the first day, not to sometime today, later tomorrow. We do post all our uh, shows, and it's a great tool. If you haven't been to our sessions, or you know someone can't be with us today, you want them to say, oh, you missed it, but you should see it, send them to our Archives and Resources page, because you're going to find a lot of data uh, to use. Where was that pointer Lorna was talking about? OK, I'm just going to go back quickly, and I'll show you where the pointer is. Right here. In the, side, in the left of the whiteboard, you see a whole bunch of little icons for tools. It's about midway down, a blue wand with a green starburst. So good. So I think it's about time to take you to that adventure. And here's the world map. So everyone gets to do this now. I want you to click on that blue wand with a starburst and go over to the map and click on the map. Mine will be a hand where you're located. See, so I'm here in St. Catharines. Well, look at it all fill up. Canadians. And lots of people from the United States, some of wandering around. <laughs> okay. uh, some people are living out in the ocean. And if you're on an island, and I don't know that, please type that in your, 
in the chat room. So we've got, I think, Great Britain, maybe France. I know Virginia's here from Italy. Uh, do we have Thailand, Japan? Somewhere along there. I'm terrible for uh, my directions. So Hawaii, there's someone in the island. And West South America's problem. Singapore, maybe? Yes? OK. Wonderful. There you go. That's the fun. So next comes the poll questions. It's going to wake you up for a minute. And this is where you're going to use the green check or the red X at the bottom of the participants window. And so your first question, are you currently teaching math or have you ever taught math? So that's a green check if you have and a red X if you haven't. Now wait a minute while everyone puts in their vote. This just gives Dan an idea who, uh, who his audience is. So it's lots of fun. Green check if you have taught math or you're teaching in a Great X if you haven't. So I'm going to show you the, the results of the poll. There we go. 75% almost of your audience today, Dan, is a math teacher or has taught math. I'm going to go clear the votes and go to the next poll question. And that is, have you ever used a scavenger hunt to teach a math concept? Green check if you haven't. Red X if you haven't. Oh, we've got some people who have done this exciting adventure into math class. A couple people not finding out how to cast their vote there, bottom of the participants window. OK, let's look at the results. Mm, 62% just about, Dan, have not done this. So I know you have something new to introduce to the audience today. So I'm going to clear the results and go to our last poll question. Has, have you seen Dan Mayer's TED Talk presentation about math class makeover? So a green check if you have, and a red X if you haven't. Yes, Kim, I loved it too. That's the one good thing about being a show host for the show. You really get to know a lot about a lot of different people doing some great things. So let's look at the results. And there we go. Uh, a little over half the class then have watched your presentation. I know that they're looking forward some, to more of good things in your, in your talk. So that's our poll question. So now it's my opportunity to introduce our guest today. And Dan Mayer is a writer, speaker, learner, worker, and I love the way he describes himself as a go-getter. He's located in the San, Fran San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I know that he's done a lot of great work, and currently his, he's a candidate for his PhD at Stanford University. And, and he's got some experience in filmmaking and motion graphics, and I think that really explains his abilities to do the kinds of things he's going to be describing today. So I'm not going to take too much longer. I'm going to give the mic over to Dan now. And Dan, if you want to take a couple of minutes to just give you a, a better picture of who you are, please do so, or just move on to your presentation. And uh, we are really happy to have you here this day. So Dan, take it away. Yeah, thank you. I, I couldn't say more than that right there, so I'll just jump right in. Um, thank you all for joining me, especially if it's uh, currently dark outside where you are. Let me tell you a story. Uh, my dad is sick, and my mom emails me, and she's telling me that they're going to take my dad uh, to Arizona from California to do some clinical trials. It's going to be an ongoing thing, and she's, she's really frazzled. Uh, there's a lot of logistics in taking care of someone who's ill. So she's passing off a, a, a mathematical question to me. And the question is this, is, is what's the best way to go from our rural hometown of Ukiah, California to the airport three hours away in San Francisco, California? Uh, she could drive straight there and then park the car in San Francisco in the parking garage. Or the other option is she could go halfway to Santa Rosa, park the car there uh, overnight for a series of nights, and then take the airport shuttle to San Francisco. And she's called, emailing me to ask me which one is the cheaper option. And I'm, I'm very grateful that she passed this off to me so I can feel, I can feel useful in this moment. Um, so I'm curious, um, let me know in the comments there, what information do you think I needed to know to figure out the answer to this question? This stuff all around here, we got cost of shuttle, uh, distances, cost of parking especially. Yeah, and it turns out that Santa Rosa, being a smaller town, 
um, has cheaper parking than San Francisco. So that was interesting. We got gas price from Joan Young. Um, Jake asks, are we optimizing for financial cost or time? And that in itself is a very interesting question. I had to ask my mom that. And uh, she wanted the cheaper option. Um, Nick Hussein says the, the, the gas mileage of the car, which is also right on. Um, so this is, this is the really interesting process whereby I'm Googling you know, for gas prices in my hometown. I'm asking my mom for the gas mileage on our family van. I'm Googling the airport uh, in San Francisco trying to find out the, the price of parking. Same in Santa Rosa, um, trying to find the, the cheapest shuttle option. And I'm compi compiling all this information and, and gradually emerges a, a two, two linear equations. And I saw the two linear equations and immediately I feel a sense of shock and immediately thereafter a sense of embarrassment. Um, shock because uh, my word, I'm using math to solve a problem in, in my real life. And uh, embarrassment because I'm shocked. Like I, I shouldn't be shocked and there I was. Uh, so I, I, I tweet this out, um, my, my amazement that uh, the stuff that I teach is actually kind of useful at times. And this, uh, this guy who may be in the room, may not be, uh, tweets back that one doesn't need to know the math these days. And he, he posts this link, and that link is to a Wolfram Alpha site, which um, a lot of math teachers are familiar with, where he's pasted in that, those two simultaneous equations, and he's shown me that it, it solves it automatically. Uh, 17, 17 days is the break-even point, uh, where the, the cheaper parking in Santa Rosa outweighs uh, the cost of the shuttle, 17 days. So if my mom is going to park with my dad, uh, you know, any longer than 17 days, they should park in Santa Rosa. But it's really just going to be for a few days uh, every month, so um, obviously they should go to, straight to San Francisco and park there. My mom is also very surprised that that was the answer. So um, interesting stuff. But uh, this, this, this gentleman, Service, in the, in the tweet here, he, he's really kind of, uh, he, he's attacking my profession and, and the relevance of my profession. I felt, I felt indignant and defensive all of a sudden, like, wait, one doesn't need to know what I teach? And um, yeah, th that's when I, I realized that, you know, what I did in that problem and what we all did in the comments there is we spent so much time formulating the problem, you know, gathering information, deciding what the best mathematical structure was for that information. And really, like, the last 10% of the problem was me solving uh, a multiple step equation. Easy solution, difficult formulation. And I defer a lot in my talks to and a quote by Einstein who talks about the formulation of a problem being the more essential piece here. Uh, the solution, you know, it's a matter of skill, um, but the formulation is where we really require a lot of creativity and a lot of uh, comprehensive knowledge of mathematical structures. And the, the subsequent tragedy here is that the curriculum that I have been asked to teach in my day has really has inverted the balance. Uh, it's been all about solution and very little about formulating problems. And so in a, in a separate talk, not this talk, I might agitate for reforming that balance, uh, you know, pushing that balance somewhere towards 50-50 or even using formulation to motivate solution and really giving formulation the lion's share. This is not that talk. I'm not going to do that here. What I'd like to, to urge all of us and urge any publishers in the room is to not mess up the small slice that we've given formulation. If we're going to give formulation such a short shrift, can we at least make it quality? There's a few ways that we as teachers and we as, 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 as curriculum developers and publishers really mess up formulation. And one of them is pseudo-context, which I'm not going to belabor here too much. Um, I, I've, it's my current blog obsession. Every week we, we talk about an example of, of pseudo-context and debate it. Um, you're welcome to use the GLAM link. I'm going to post the link into the, into the comments right now, or you can go for more information on pseudo-context. Um, this right here, pseudo-context is where we we, the teacher, the publisher, whatever, use the full force of our authority to impose math on a context that doesn't want it. So right here, this dog doesn't want you to apply special right triangles to it. But because we're, we have the power here, we can insist 
that that dog represents special white triangles. And it, it does terrible things to our kids, and especially and their, their, their sense of, of math as being a relevant discipline, because they know that this is a lie, essentially. It, it alienates me from my students and my students from math when you ask me to teach uh, pseudo-context. So assuming we have really, really good context, there's other ways that we mess up the formulation of problems. And that's what we'll just call it pseudo-problem solving, for lack of more crea a creative uh, name here. And uh, one of those, it, it, this is when I talk about my TEDx talk. I'm glad a few folks haven't, haven't seen that. Um, right here, what we have in this problem is three inputs that each figure into an, a given equation somewhere. This is so far removed from what we just did with the San Francisco Santa Rosa problem where we didn't have any information and we had to get all the information. And at one point I had too much information. The guy had gone out and found the weather for the week that they were traveling, for instance, and that turned out to be not relevant. And so I had to throw it out. But this process here teaches students that you have exactly enough information and all that needs to happen is you need to put that information into a formula to solve it. This is pseudo problem solving and it gets worse in the actual, this is a sample problem, in the actual practice problems, you know, if you don't recognize that this context here has just been shifted slightly, uh, the textbook helpfully informs you which sample problem to go back to and then you're just plugging numbers back in again. It's a pseudo problem solving. Um, and so I, I turn here and an exercise that I occupy myself with when I'm, when I'm bored or on a drive or whatever is that imagine how would the textbook have formulated my really interesting San Francisco Santa Rosa problem? What would a textbook have done with the same really exhilarating uh, and really challenging mathematical experience? How would it represent it? And here's, here's my conclusion. Uh, one is that we would need a really fancy graphic and then we also need to set the scene here. We would give the students all the information they need and nothing more. And then, uh, you know, we break the problem down into a series of steps. Um, set up the equation for San Francisco, set up the equation for Santa Rosa. And then we'd ask students to try it to plug in a certain number of days that will be on both sides of the break-even point. And uh, then, we'd, then we'd lead to the real kicker here, the hook, if you will, after how many days the plans cost exactly the same. So I, I just invite you to have a look at that right there. This is how the textbook and it's almost inexorable. This process can't be stopped. The momentum of this process for publishers, I have a lot of sympathy for them because they, they have to put this problem on one page. So what are you going to do? What are your options as a publisher? And I'm not sure there are a lot of good ones if you're still printing on paper on dead trees because you have to fit all this onto one page. And that's just that's pseudo problem solving. It's a, it's a paper representation of real satisfying problem solving. Um, so. I'd encourage you also to see this, see this problem here as four separate layers that have all been compressed into one for the sake of, of the cost of paper. And when all four are pressed together, um, some very negative things happen for students. One is that there's a visual that almost always accompanies these sort of problems. There's the mathematical structure, which in this case is uh, you know, the, in, the given information. In other cases, you might have diagrams drawn on top of uh, the image. The image here won't, won't really permit that, it's just clip art. But if you see diagrams on top of images, that's structure. And then there's the steps which all lead to the hook. So those four layers all compress into one. And that really interests me. Um, each layer has its own place and putting them all together has this destructive effect. Like when you, when you give students the structure in advance, I'm, I'm really curious, if a student didn't know that this information was necessary to solve the problem, what does it do to give the student that information? I can see in one case, if a student is really mathematically proficient, it may jog that student to figure out why that information is necessary. But if a student is on the other side of the proficiency line there, if a student is not proficient, giving that information to the student will do no good and it may also intimidate the student off the problem. Like I'm supposed to know what this information is useful for. Compare that to what we did where you're thinking, uh, what information do I need here? And you're, you're, you're formulating the problem. You're developing a plan for that information at the same time that you're deciding that it's useful. Like how bizarre is that, the difference between those two processes? Um, when, you, when we give the students the steps, this is the real tragedy to me is that we are making the problem simultaneously less fun and less cognitively demanding. 
how strange is that? That um, you know, I associate a lot of really fun times with my students with really cognitively undemanding tasks. You know, the classroom party, watching a movie, that digression that you take off into left field. That we're not really doing a lot of heavy work, but man, are we having fun? That's the association here. And and, and here we're, we're giving the students so much help. So the demand is lower, but we're also making it a lot less fun. The, the fun and the challenge and the satisfaction is in, is in creating those steps for yourself. So um, I'm looking to change this process of, of, of my textbook makes problems unengaging and cognitively undemanding. We're going to score a double win here. We're going to make the problem simultaneously more engaging and also more mathematically challenging. We get a double win with what happens next here. And the first thing I really recommend is that you get the hook out in front. Like right here, uh, the hook, you'll notice here, comes at the very end of the problem. But that's not how, how I solve the problem when I'm, my mom asked me. It's not how you were considering the problem when I asked you. How that works is we're constantly thinking, which is cheaper? Which is cheaper? Which is cheaper? Which is cheaper? And, and that governs the entire process. Every, every, every datum that I'm considering, I, I evaluate against, you know, it, will this help me figure out which is cheaper? Every sub-step in the problem, I'm wondering, will this help me figure out which is cheaper? So that is out in front every time. And I'd wager that's the case in, in every valuable problem you solve in your personal life that you have had a hook out in front of you. So the, the interesting exercise for me here also is to take a textbook problem and to ask myself, where is, what is the hook here? What is the hook? Um, you know, feel free. Take some folks a second. David Wee, David Wee sees it. Kelvin Jones sees it. Right. It's find the height of a tree. And notice that it's in, uh, Matt Montaigne notices that C is the hook. It's at the very end. So when students are finding the constant of variation, they have no idea why they're doing that. Um, and just try, try, we'll do two more really fast here. Go ahead and punch in um, what is the hook right here. Yeah, excellent. A lot of folks seen it here. Will it clear the net? Is the hook right there? And again, it's at the very end. Uh -huh. um, last, last example here. And the fact that it's taking so many of us, even you know, like a minute or, or 30 seconds to find that the hook is how long is the skid mark, I wager that if the hook is not found right away that we're doing a, our students a, a disservice. This is pseudo problem solving. If our students have to think even for a second what the hook is here, if that isn't out in front right away, our students aren't going to put in 30 seconds to find the hook like we have here. They're just bored through A and B. So after, after this discipline of getting the hook out in front, the question becomes what is the most evocative image that will represent that hook? And for me, it was the Google Maps side by side of San Francisco and Santa Rosa. In this case right here, notice that the image of the, that they used was to, to associate, to supplement, to help out the hook, how long is the skid mark, the image is of a, a policeman doing that, that job, doing that business, which reflects a serious misunderstanding in how visuals can help out this math problem here. If the question is how long is the skid mark, what would the, the most evocative visual be? And my contention is uh, the visual needs to be a skid mark. And so we're asking the question, um, you know, or, 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 or a speedometer. Either way, depending on what direction you take the problem. But if you, if you have an image of a skid mark, the question can be how fast was the person going? And then you have this problem right here. So finding the evocative Im images to supplement hooks that are out in front is like 90% of my, what I do in curriculum development. That's all. What is the hook and what is the best image to, to supplement that hook? So um, an example here that, that I favor is, is this image of a ticket roll, the kind that you would use for a raffle um, you know, to, to pass out uh, drinks 
Kool-Aid juice, that sort of thing. What question do you guys have about this image? If you had to walk away here from here knowing the answer to only one question, what would that question be? So a lot of folks want to know how many tickets are on the roll. Fine. Would you guys real fast in the, in the comment box, uh, give me an estimate. How many tickets do you think are on the roll? Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, this is an interesting range of answers here. We're in the thousands. David says 500. Would you guys write down also a number, two numbers now, two numbers. One that you know is definitely too low and one that you know is definitely too high. Like there's no way there's that many tickets on the roll. Damien has us between 1,000 and 10,000 here. Um, some folks are, are, are less ambitious. Carol has us between 0 and 1 billion. Okay, so, you know, that's great. We have a range now. I'm curious, what information do you think would be useful to determine the answer to our question here? What information would you need to know to determine the answer? So the dimensions of one ticket, we have the radius of the roll. Radius of roll is interesting. I'm not sure I know what radius of roll means in this case. Because um, I, I, mean, I see two circles here. So we have the, the inner and the outer radius is interesting there. So yeah, so I would then, this is, this is me treating you guys like students in my class. I would then go ahead and uh, you know, give you that information you wanted. Here's the outer diameter, the inner diameter, uh, length of a ticket, height of a ticket. And uh, some folks want to know that the full dimensions, 0.22 millimeters, is the, is the depth, the thickness of a ticket. And great, and because you've done this hard work of, of setting boundaries for yourself, deciding what information you need, um, because you've done all that, you have sort of this plan brewing, which means that when I say, all right, try it out, see what you can do, no one is raising their hand up and saying, I don't know where to start, which is a very common question uh, that I get with textbook problems because it, the textbook takes away this, this formulation aspect from the student. Um, and so, you know, granted, some folks will move really fast through this problem. Other folks uh, need a lot of help. And this is where, as teachers, we earn our pay. This is where we go around and we talk to groups and we see where they're, where they're moving, what their, their misapprehensions are, what their, their wrong assumptions are, and we ask nudging questions that get them back on track. That's, that's, that's our business. Um, there's very little that I can, I can do in this talk to help you with, with that, but I'll say it, it really helps to have done this problem as many times as I have that I've seen so many wrong answers. So many wrong answers is very helpful. Um, and then because some groups finish very quickly, if you're going to commit yourself to this kind of problem formulation, this kind of inquiry learning, you can't do them a disservice. You have to have something for them to do something that will, that will ratchet up the cognitive demand even more. So you ask an extension question. And I'm curious here, which of these three extension questions would be the most cognitively demanding? And simultaneously, which would be less accusable of being busy work? So Nathan's, Nathan's saying, I'll, I'll grab Nathan and Kelvin here, they say that the last one is busy work. And, and if, if you have an internal compass that tells you the last one is busy work, and it is, then, then don't listen to me here. My, the way I, I see it as busy work is that it's asking students um, to commit to the exact same operations that they did earlier just with a different number for inner diameter. Whereas, uh, and, and really, I mean, the, sa the same thing is sort of true for the middle one. I think the middle one is less, the middle one has an interesting feature where if we, if we double the outer diameter, students may think that we double the number of tickets, um, which, which turns out to not be true. As, as we add length to the diameter, you know, we're adding more and more tickets. So there's that interesting feature. But it's not as good to me as how big would a roll have to be to hold 1 million tickets. That question requires you to do the whole operation in reverse. I ask that question, no one's accusing me of busy work and the motivated student who's really proficient is tearing into it. So I, I have this highly productive class right now. And, and one of the best parts about this kind of problem is that I get to be on the same team as my student. It's not my students working through this problem. 
asking me, is it correct? And then I turn to the back of the book and find out. Um, I get to be on the same team and say, I, like, I don't know, I really want to know too. And then at the very end of it, I show them this image here, which says that the answer is 2,000 tickets. So that the answer is visible in real life. It's outside of the teacher's jurisdiction. I get to be on the same team as my students, both of us searching for the same answer, which is just, it just does amazing things. I mean, I'd say this is, this is obviously superior to the similar textbook problem, but it also pays off dividends later on in the class and you can't get with the textbook. It contributes to this culture of curiosity um, that we are, we are in dogged pursuit of mathematical truth. And that, that's a really fun thing. By the end of the year, the classes will look very different. Um, the class that pursues one kind of problem formulation and the other that pursues textbook style formulation. And my, my personal enthusiasm about these problems is that I can, you know, I can put all these images and the measurements into a folder and zip it up and then I can email that folder to a colleague. I can put it on my blog where it's downloadable by whoever stops by, put it on a thumb drive and walk it down the hall. I can put it on a, you know, a server and offer it to you right now. If you type in tinyurl.com slash ticket roll, like shabam, you have it right there. And that, that is just such a fascinating model to me where if we can, if, if you're familiar with the structure of these kind of problems, this is, this is instantly useful to you. Um, just jumping back real fast, just to, to be clear, the teacher moves here were pretty intentional. When I asked you um, to, when I asked you for a question that interested you, I mean, that, that's, that's to, both to engage you in asking questions about the world around you. I want you to get in that habit, but it's also for me to know if, if the question that came from most people wasn't how many tickets are there, I knew I had done something wrong. I need to find a better image to as associate with that hook. When I asked you to guess the answer, let me hear you in the comments. Uh, what was the point of asking you to guess the answer? Yeah, gosh, a lot of stuff here that I, I didn't even consider really. Um, I mean, buy-in is a huge part here. And there are students who, who don't buy into these processes. Um, we're trying to pique their curiosity. It's a very, like it's asking the students to invest very little, but it pays off huge dividends because once they've invested that small amount, they want to know the answer. So it, it's, it's, it's crafty. It's crafty. Um, I asked you for a high end and a low end, an upper bound and a lower bound. What was the point of that, to ask you for a number that was way too high, that you knew was too low? Less certainty here. Um, folks are just, just saying nouns here, like estimation or error balance. It's not, um, not a response. Let's see here. Eliminate the need to be exactly right. Very interesting. So some of these may well be true. The reason, the most compelling reason that I have to do that is because when I get to the end of, of a problem, say find the height of a flagpole and the student has that the flagpole is 200 feet tall and I ask the student, is that answer reasonable? Does that seem right? The student invariably says, yeah. Like I, I use the math, I punch it into my calculator, it's the answer that I worked for, it seems right. Asking does the answer seem reasonable at the end of the problem has rarely served me well, but doing this at the start lets me say to the student at the end, does this answer square with the bounds that you put on the problem at the very start? Um, the best time to, to ask them to put error bounds on their problem is I found at the beginning. Asking them uh, what information they need, we've talked about, we've covered quite a bit, the importance of asking students you know, what information will be necessary for you here. Um, and that's just the, that's the structure. That's the structure of these, this kind of problem formulation. It, it, it's not pseudo problem. It mimics actual problem solving. So when I send you, you know, this when I send you this link, you know what to do with it. Um, would you guys right now? I'd like for you to watch a quick two and a half minute video that I think summarizes a lot of problems and a lot of solutions here. Would you would you head to this link right here? That's in the comments. I'll give you three minutes on the clock.
Okay. Uh, where is that big problem? Feel free to watch it later. Um, what happens in this movie, Little Big League, is that the you know, it's a, a movie where uh, E-Horse says it's running. Are we okay? I'm going to move on here. Uh, I really encourage you to watch it. Highlighting the, the really essential bits here is that you have a high school student who is asking his team for help. He's on a baseball team, not sure why that happened. Asking his team for help with a word problem so he can then go out and pitch and play. And the problem is uh, one guy paints a house in three hours, another guy paints a house in five hours. How long will it take them to paint the house together? One of the most universally reviled problems in all of math them. And it's really interesting the solutions that the, the team comes up with. All of them are kind of kind of thick. Um, you know, one one multiplies three times five and gets fifteen. Another adds three plus five and gets eight hours. So they will they will take eight hours to, to paint the house together. Another divides three plus five by two, takes the average of the two, and gets four hours for both of them to paint the house. It's just interesting to me that process where, whereby these people are taking the numbers of the problem and kind of banging them together like two pieces of flint, hoping that sparks will fly out. It's this, uh, impatient, it's this, it's this impatient problem solving that I talked about in my TED talk where you know, we, we train students to look for the formula. That's what they're going to do. And at the very end, the triumphant conclusions of the scene is when, when the person that we assume was the dumbest of them all comes up and solves the problem using, and I quote, the simple formula A times B divided by A plus B. And he gets one and seven eighths. And this is what we often do is we teach the formula and then we give several practice problems and then we, we consider students proficient on the assessment. And, and giving them that formula, it, this, this, is, this is the sum total of, of the problems with pseudo problem solving in my opinion. I, I created a different problem that I'd love for you to try to open up here. This one's much shorter. Um, this, is, this is entirely new. Um, let's see. This is the first group I've ever shown this with. I'm really curious how this goes. 30 second clip. Green check if you're done watching this. Like it was incorrect. It was not fun to make because I was literally putting beans into a cup for 22 minutes. Incorrect. Um, quick behind the scenes note on this is that in, in our earbuds, we're not just like listening to music to keep us from, from going insane with boredom. Inside of our earbuds, each of us is a pace. Uh, the, the, the track that's in my ears literally is bean, tick, 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 bean, tick. Tick, tick. So we've turned kind of the, the pseudo contextual nature of, of the problem as it lives in a textbook where these people always take three hours to paint a house. We've actually videotaped it, which, which takes it out of the realm of pseudo context. There's actually an answer uh, to this problem here. And you know, the, other, the other thing is that that's so interesting to me is that when we teach the formula, we get, we get these people that will say that one man takes three hours to paint a house, another five hours, and together they take eight hours. 
And if you think about that for even a second, it's, it's kind of insane, right, that it would take longer when painting together. Or even, I mean, the answer has to be less than three hours, which if we get students into more of a, a patient problem-solving mindset, that will become clear. That I need to pause, hold up a second, put a guess on the answer, estimate an upper bound, lower bound. Yeah, it's got to be less than three. So when we use this video that you just saw, um, and we go through the same exact process I demoed with the ticket roll. I give a guess, error bounds, what question interests you, what information do you need. When we do that, students will then become patient with these problems. Um, and moreover, if we give students the formula A times B divided by A plus B, um, you know, what happens when we give them uh, this right here? You know, what happens if we throw a, even the smallest smallest, most natural wrench into the problem and do three people at the same time and say ask how long Annie would take to go solo, they'll, they'll fall down. They might try to do A times B times C divided by A plus B plus C, but the formula doesn't work out that nicely. And so the, their, their knowledge is not transferable to even the most natural adjacent concept. So that's, 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 my, that's my argument there. Uh, a secondary argument for these kind of problems. Um, and I would call this this form of learning, I would call this perplexity. Uh, these are objects of perplexity. These are objects that naturally inspire a perplexing question, like how long will it take them uh, to, to do it together? And so in terms of the technology that I use here, I don't use a lot of you know, social web technologies. I think that, that math has so much improvement just on the, on the pencil and paper level before we really need to use those kind of technologies. What I'm, what I'm interested in as a, as a curriculum developer is tools that will let me capture perplexity, share perplexity, and resolve perplexity. Uh, those are the most valuable to me. So in terms of capturing perplexity, uh, we had, I, I want to be able to take a, a YouTube video, you know, photos, TV shows, DVDs, whatever, wherever I find perplexing math, I need a way to get that in front of my student. So that's, that's the hook for me in this, in this problem. What technology do I use? The hook for me is what will let me get perplexing math in front of my students? So to capture it here, like all I used for the ticket roll problem was a scanner. That's it. So that's a tool that I need. Um, I found this interesting water graph, this graph of water consumption that, that many of you probably have seen um, during the Olympic gold medal hockey game and how bizarre it is that, that water usage basically dries up in Edmonton uh, uh, that w sorry, water usage peaks in Edmonton um, at the end of each period when everybody's running to the bathroom at the same time, and that water usage dries up when Canada finally wins, and, and during the medal ceremony, no one is on the can. So this is a very perplexing way to interpret graphs. Uh, I want to capture it, and I got this from Google Reader. I don't have to make the case to, to many of you about Google Reader, but if you, if you haven't investigated Google Reader, definitely do that. I also need some way to, to take this and store it for later. So I, I use Google Reader has a feature that lets me send, uh, send this perplexing object to Delicious, which is a way of saving things so I don't have to remember them. So I add myself you know, a little des description, some tags about where they might be useful. Maybe I use the perplexity tag, and, and that basically creates a shelf on my digital wall where I store these jars that hold fireflies, these little perplexing things. I can just pull them off the perplexity shelf whenever I want to. Maybe you add your, your district's tags, you can share inside your district different perplexing things, um, and then you move on. I also use Jot, uh, which is the only service that I pay for. Jot is so useful for those moments when I find math out in the world and I have no paper on me, I have no way to capture it. Um, so for instance, uh, I'm in Starbucks, a coffee shop here in the States, and I see, you know, I notice that, that, whoa, there's an interesting pattern to the coffee prices there. It's like it's, it's linear pricing at Starbucks. So I call this number and I, I say linear pricing at Starbucks. And, um, and then I get an email immediately that's, that has that exact line in it that I can save. And it's, it's a method for me not to have to remember this because my, my brain is terrible at remembering and it's, it's better at coming up with ideas than remembering them. Um, some folks may say Google Voice is a better option for this. It's also free. I don't know. I just uh, that's that's also a good option. Um, my mobile phone. 
is great for taking pictures these days, which freaks me out. I think this is awesome that I have a camera with me wherever I go. Um, so if I'm in a store and I, you know, I notice, well, there's, okay, so there's two ways to buy Gatorade. Um, there's the, 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 large, the large jugs and then there's the smaller six pack. Uh, what's, you know, what's the perplexing question here? Well, the best price here is obviously 179. Um, you know, which is the better deal, though, is kind of an interesting question that involves price per ounce. And you notice there that I put a, a black box conveniently over the answers. So students have to work at it, and then we have again that really cool moment where we see that oh, like the math and the real world, they dialogue together. They have this conversation. It's not just uh, a math teacher or a publisher asking students to pseudo problem solve, pseudo context. Um, so the photo is great for that. What do you do if you see a, a really interesting video on YouTube? For example, this is just one of the, the coolest things. This is the coolest example I have of a major media corporation creating, inadvertently creating math curriculum for us math teachers. Um, ESPN did us a huge favor here. So you find this video on YouTube. It's in the Glam links. Um, how, do you, how do you get this off of YouTube? Because YouTube is, if your wireless goes down, if, if YouTube's blocked, if there's, I mean, there's all sorts of awful related videos and, and you know, comments that are borderline illiterate, sometimes profane. So you, how do you get videos off of YouTube in front of your students? I use Zamzar where you, know, you just you, you punch in, you, you copy and paste the URL, say make me a movie, enter your email address and hit convert, and it's done. So this is a, a very fast drive-by through a lot of tools I use. You can always go back to this and if you want to learn more, um, you know, email me or Google it. And then it gives you, it gives you a, a, a video link that, you know, like our video clip that I can use whenever, wherever, put on a thumb drive, go to a presentation, talk about it. Um, what about if you watch a DVD? A lot of folks had ideas for YouTube, but if you watch, say, the movie Holes has a really fantastic moment. This is where uh, kids are sent to this penal colony to dig holes for one hole per day for the length of their sentence. There's this awesome moment in, in the movie where our young hero, Stanley, who has just arrived there, picks up someone else's shovel, and that kid takes it back really roughly because the shovel is shorter. And the shovel is how they measure if you're done for the day. It's where you, 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 if, you, if you dug a hole that's as tall as your shovel is tall and as wide as your shovel is, is long, you're done. So the shorter shovel means less digging. Um, this is just a fantastic scene, and we've gone some very interesting directions with this in class, but I don't want to have to queue up the DVD or even have a DVD to make this lesson work. I want to clip on my hard drive. And if you taught during the film strip era, it's possible this is less of a big deal to you than it is to me, but um, what tool do you use to make that happen? And uh, I find Handbrake exceptionally useful where you just put it in, and uh, adjust some settings, and out comes you know, your, holes, your, your holes excerpt, which is great. The flip camera is what I used for a while to do video, but now my mobile phone does pretty good video. Um, so what a great world where we have these awesome curriculum development tools in our front pockets. So other tools that I'm interested in are ones that let me share that perplexity with my students once it's captured. So this is, this, is, this is the stable. These are my horses right here. What I, what I love to use is uh, the, the laptop lets me project the perplexing object through the projector um, you know, so we can talk about it and work on the math. And then the document camera, at one point I kind of derided it, like I derided interactive whiteboards a bit as being kind of a superfluous piece. But the document camera fulfills a purpose that no other tool I've found can. And that is, it lets me turn student work into an object of perplexity. So when I'm walking around working with groups and I see an interesting solution or even an interesting error, error and I, I grab that paper and say, oh my gosh, guys, look at this. You have to see what happened here. And I put the student work up, uh, up in front of the class. Celebrating error and non-standard solutions is one of the best things that I can do for a student uh, to get across the creative formulation aspect of math. So the document camera does that. Uh, I love blogging. I love sharing perplexing objects on my blog because then I get you know 29 comments from people who who tell me that you know you should angle at this question or you know formulate the problem in this way, and it, it makes the math that my students see that much better. So 
finally, the, the tools that help me resolve perplexity, this is kind of a cheat, but it's, it's, those are your content standards. Those are the skills that you teach. If you captured the math perplexingly, if you shared the math in the most perplexing way, then students want the tools that you have. Like for the holes clip, if I do my job right in the capturing and sharing departments, they want to know how to find the volume of a cylinder. And so that's the tool to resolve perplexity. Um, you know, in English, so we can jump over to ELA. I saw this at one point from some other blogger that I've uh, shamefully failed to cite here. Sorry about that. Um, but the, the tool to resolve this perplexing object is what? Scissors, very nice. Yeah, comma, uh, comma. This is we can teach commas here or spaces. You know, we have illustrated the need for what we, what other teachers might just take for granted. Okay, this is what a space is. This is what a comma is, and where you use it. We've, you know, we can we can reform this thing with with these tools. Um, punctuation also, exactly. Uh, just a really stellar example, you know, of 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 a perplexing object that illustrates the need for commas, for understanding commas. You know, I love this stuff. Um, thank you so much for your questions here and your comments. Uh, at this point, I, I hope the moderators have been, have been grabbing any questions that have popped up, any unclear moments. Um, we'll turn it over to you guys right now. Great. Thank you. I'm not sure my mic is. Okay. Um, I've been taking some questions, and one of them is, so is the problem simply the textbook or that there is a textbook when you were introducing the problems and talking about the pseudo context? Yeah, great question. Um, I have no, I, I use textbooks constantly for ideas. Um, you know, the, the ticket roll problem came from a textbook, but what I do is I, you know, I, I eliminate what is pseudo contextual and pseudo problem solving about it by taking a, a photo of it or scanning it. So I would love it if, if textbooks wouldn't force me to do that intermediate step and instead if they would provide a really robust digital resource of, you know, for instance, the actual ticket roll. If they would do that and maybe throw out some of the supplementary handouts that I never use that are in that big, that big case that comes with the textbook, I would be thrilled. Excellent, excellent, excellent explanation. And Maureen asks, why do students have to be able to type the problems at all? Why do they care and why is it relevant? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if those questions are, are directed at me or just rhetorical, but I think that that, like, that question is, is absolutely the guiding compass, um, you know, for, for curriculum development. Why should anybody care? And, and I mean, the fact is, is, you know, if you ask someone, Hey, do you care about how many tickets are on this ticket roll? Um, odds are pretty good that they might say no, but if instead you say, can you guess how many tickets are on this ticket roll, then, I mean, you wouldn't believe what that simple, that simple brief act does for a student's investment in the problem. Suddenly, they want to know. And time, again, time and again, I've got so many interesting testimonials of teachers taking very mundane digital objects, like, you know, like this ticket roll here asking that question and students don't want to move on. I challenge teachers, ask the question, what's your guess? Take their guesses and then just move on to what you're going to do. And, and teachers have reported open revolt. I could definitely I could see definitely that and imagine that be, like a teaser. Um, you know, that would be frustrating as a student to start something and not be able to finish it. Um, some, uh, Teresa asked, how do you answer math teachers who say they have no time to, to teach and to use these types of problems in their curriculum? I mean, the, it's an obvious concern, I think, to me that, that the ticket roll problem as we did it took, takes more time than just inserting it into a textbook. And I was worried and my department was worried as I pursued this, this strategy of problem solving and I was really shocked that we wound up ahead of the department at the semester benchmark 
uh, both in terms of proficiency and in terms of how far we've gone through the curriculum. Like how did we make up lost time when we're, when we're taking five times as long to solve the same problem? And the answer, the answer I determined is that a lot of really good stuff is happening um, in addition, external to the actual problem where my students are becoming really hungry and, and they are, are self-directed in a way that I couldn't expect before. And so our times of direct instruction were becoming briefer and briefer and briefer. I was lecturing far less and students were doing more work faster. It was really strange, but um, yeah, it, it doesn't take, you, you have to try it out obviously and see if it's something that, that fits you, but as a, as a general pattern of problem solving, there's a lot of really great side benefits that come from this. And yes, Maureen, I'll add that question to the list. Um, how does using these types of problems fit into standardized testing, and what type of assessments do you use for your students? Yeah, great question. Um, it, nothing could be farther from standardized tests than the kind of problem solving we're, we're working on here. Um, but the, the fact is, is that the, the skills that, that students are developing solving the ticket roll problem, asking themselves what information is important here, what's my guess, wrapping their head around it, that, that's useful skills for any kind of problem, especially ones that are, are of, of really low cognitive demand like standardized tests. Um, solving high cognitive demands problems um, will help them solve the lower cognitive demanding ones. Um, my own assessments, I assess, I assess basic skills. Like I assess, I do standards-based grading, I assess standards. So I want to know, for example, with the ticket roll, the assessment in class might be, um, can you find the area of an annulus? So it's, you know, I, I value the problem solving to the, I, I invest a lot of class time into this patient problem solving in terms of what I'm willing to hold a student back for to not pass them from geometry is, can you not find the area of an annulus? It's not, I don't want to hold a student back if they can't fully complete this very large, all-encompassing problem on their own. Great, thank you about the assessments and talking about open source and Matt mentioned, what are your thoughts on the development of open source textbooks and and do, could we have teachers and curriculum designers build better text in an open source market? Yeah, I mean, it's a very exciting time to be a teacher watching, watching a lot of these kind of open source developments and electronic textbooks show up. Uh, I think the obvious danger is that it just becomes a digital version of the same uh, tired dead tree format. Um, and that's kind of my worry with, with uh, with movements like Curriki or Flexbooks, I'm worried that they're they're giving away for free a product that I, I already presume to be pretty bad. So I mean, I'm grateful I, I don't have to pay for it, but I would like better. Um, I think we're seeing some of the some of that open sourcing of these kind of problems in in the movement on blogs and in, on Twitter. The the what can you do with this? Um, movement where teachers are going out and they're actually creating these and they're sharing them, it's just really poorly organized. And at some point we'll create some better way to organize these perplexing objects. But um, I, I agree with the necessity of it, certainly. And Dan, um, or another question is, what if the hook doesn't hook and how do you build a culture where students care about solving problems? Yeah, great question. I mean, if the hook doesn't hook, and that has happened where, where I ask, what questions would you like to know about this image, and no one comes up with the question I'm after, like, I'll just ask the question I'd like them to consider. Um, you know, that's an unfortunate exercise of my authority as a teacher. I'll be bummed about it. I'll definitely make a note to myself to get a better uh, perplexing image later, but I'll just go with it and say, this is what my textbook does absolutely every lesson of every day. Um, so that's, that's unfortunate, but a reality sometimes. And when do you ask these types of questions? Are these your openers? Um, is this assessment at the end of a lesson, throughout the lesson? Yeah, excellent question about scope and sequence of these kind of problems. And the answer is yes. I mean, 
it definitely depends. So for instance, on the ticket roll, um, my students already know how to find the area of a circle. I don't want to teach them the formula for area of an annulus. I want them to develop that on their own. And let's, let's, let's be real with each other. Like math is a fairly inductive uh, yeah, discipline. Like one concept leads to the other in a very nice way. So a lot of concepts can be, can be generated from older concepts. That's what I want. In terms of um, the, the bean counting video, I would use that as an introduction. Uh, to the whole concept. I would just, I would put that, we would do a separate opener. Um, I wouldn't use this for the opener necessarily, uh, but this would be the introduction to the concept, not an application of the concept in the case of the ticket rule. So the answer is it varies. And John asks, how do you dialogue with teachers that are skill focused versus focused on the problem solving? I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, skill focus and skills in isolation, I'm assuming, um, and like head prep focus. And how do you convince them to 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 change the their perception of the way that they should structure their lessons? You know, I think you you get into this job because I'm. Uh, some part of you really enjoys mathematical investigation at some point. And maybe over time, over a career that's, that's gradually eroded and coerced out of you, and I, I get that that's kind of the natural way of things, unfortunately, with um, a very test-focused environment. Um, what, I, what I love to do is just to work through a problem like the ticket roll with a teacher, and it's really an exhilarating process for math teachers to reconnect with um, the kind of math teaching that they, or math learning that they love. So I think maybe the best way to get teachers to change their practice towards more exhilarating learning isn't to, to browbeat them and to shame them, as is the case with so many of our leaders online in the, in the, the educational technology community, but instead just to give them the, the opportunity to experience that exhilarating learning for themselves. And that's important, that autonomy and uh, self-confidence. Um, another Dante, I'm a fifth grade teacher. Fifth grade teacher. Our district's been Our using district's the program of investigation. And are you familiar with that? And what is your opinion of that program? Uh, yeah, real, real sorry, I can't weigh in. Not familiar with it. Um, would, you, would you leave in the comments the, the exact title and the publisher, if you know it? I'd love to follow up on that. I think it's probably the Turk investigations that leads into the connected math components that are at the secondary level. Mm, Pearson got it. investigation. Okay. Turk investigations. Okay, that's. We're going to go ahead and go ahead and formally close the show, but we invite everybody to continue on um, in the post show and continue these conversations. We understand if you have to leave, but we're going to be mindful of our commitment to a one-hour session and close things up. But we are going to still continue to ask questions of Dan. And we want to let you know that next week, these are our upcoming sessions. And next Saturday, we will have on some special guests that I met in in Odyssey in Denver at the conference recently this past summer, Will and Webb and Lisa Nelson, and they're going to be talking about generation teaching generation text. Um, that's going to be a great session on the ways that they use cell phones, and that's very it's going to be a very interesting session on uh, next Saturday at the same time. And when you exit today's session, you will be given the opportunity to complete a survey. And we hope that you'll give us some feedback about your participation today, as well as future guests that you'd like to uh, have on our sessions. You can also request a professional development certificate. Just enter your name and email address, and Peggy will get those out to you in the week. Uh, give us a bit of time. It takes a few days for us to get the information from Illuminate, and we'll get those out to you during the week. And if for some reason the survey doesn't open, you can email us at live at classroom20.com, 
and then you can uh, Peggy will send the certificate out to you in case the survey portion doesn't work. We also have an iTunes U channel coordinated through Arizona's Ideal platform that Peggy helped us assist helped us set up. And to access that, you can go to tinyurl.com slash CR20Live iTunes U. You can take our sessions with you, including this one that will be posted to our website later this weekend. We want to give a very special thanks to Dan Meyer for joining us today. We're going to go ahead now and uh, pass it back in just a second. And we want to thank all of the participants for joining us today. And we're going to continue to take questions in just a second. We want to make sure that uh, you're aware that Illuminate and Learn Center have sponsored this session. And we're very grateful to Steve Hargadon and them for allowing us to meet in this forum each week. Yes, I will repeat the uh, that's our iTunes U address, and our website is live.classroom20.com, and that's where the archives will be posted later this weekend. And the survey will open as soon as you exit the session, and then you can give us some great feedback, hopefully, on future topics in today's session and your opinions. And so now we're going to go back to questions. And uh, let me go back to my list and pick up Dan. So to what extent should problems and problem solving contain a single solution that is the correct or the right answer? That's a really excellent question. Um, yeah, how to answer that. You know, it's, here's one of the strangest things to me about the ticket roll problem is that when students complete the work, there's three methods that students typically take, and each one comes up with the same wrong answer. They all come up with, because of how I've measured the ticket roll incorrectly and some variation probably in the ticket roll itself, they all come up with 1,929. And the strangest thing happens where uh, when students see the answer is 2,000 on the ticket roll, it's bizarre how, how much more satisfying that is for them than to see the answer is exactly what they got from the math, which is how the, how the textbook would, would auto, always work out to exactly 2,000 tickets, which I think to them contributes to the sense that, okay, there's some, there's some funny business here. There's some funny games being played um, with math. Like it's, it never works out that well. So getting within 4% error is awesome. Now, if we give the students a photo of the ticket roll, each one of them, and allow them to make their own measurements, the answers are then even farther, and, and there's a wider range of answers. They all kind of come close, but there's like you know, 1,900, 1,800, 2,200. And that there, to me as a math teacher, I think is great. I don't care because they've all, they've all committed to the same mathematical investigation. They're just using different constants. So everyone who used the annulus method, like they all have equal proficiency with the annulus. Um, just because they, get, they use different numbers does nothing wrong with the math. It, it, all it does is it makes them feel more invested in the problem themselves. Maybe that answers the question. I think that, I think that was a great, ex, um, great solution. And, um, and back uh, on, if back the hook on, doesn't hook students, how do you build a student a culture where students care about solving problems and they're interested in, in attacking these types of problems? I think celebrating non-standard answers in whatever math you're doing is the best, easiest thing you can do as a math teacher to, to create that kind of culture. You know, if someone solves a problem in some strange way, you bring it up, you put it underneath the document camera, or you talk about it, you celebrate it, you think, wow, that's interesting. You ask the question, do you guys see what Jim did here? This is just wild. Uh, if you do that one small step, I think that, that creates a culture in your classroom that angles itself towards just chewing away at interesting problems. I agree. You just immerse them in that type of culture or learning environment. 
Uh, Matt also asks, what are your thoughts on effective parent engagement and support for this type of instruction? And how do you get parents on your side and extend those conversations and work into the home environment? Yeah, I mean, I did this. I did this work with very, very remedial populations. So uh, parent engagement was a lot lower. You know, I, I, I wouldn't send this kind of problem home. This problem is is exceptionally useful when the teacher is on hand to look at student work and to ask questions that nudge students towards greater understanding. Uh, you know, this would be a very frustrating experience to send home with a student to have that student there just kind of bereft bobbing up and down in the ocean, um, I think that, teacher, uh, that parents would probably you know, have a very negative reaction towards that. So for homework, I assign one problem a night as a, an easier problem and a harder problem if you want to challenge yourself. They're both graded exactly the same credit. Um, but it's a, it's a problem that kind of expands on what we did during the day. And um, I haven't received much pushback from parents. Along those same lines of assessment, what are some more effective ways to end a semester or a year in math beyond the traditional paper pencil type of cumulative examination? It's a great question. Um, I I don't know. I guess um, some some semesters I haven't done that uh, because I feel like I, my standards-based grading is so comprehensive and I do it so often every week that. I have a good sense of what students know by the end of the semester. Um, there's rarely any surprises. I've seen there's some neat portfolio work out there, but um, I don't I don't have much to offer here. Sorry. And Matt asks, what are some powerful projects that we can engage students in where they're required to use these skills they've been building all semester or all year? I mean, gosh, if you're looking for a comprehensive single single project that enfolds all of these concepts, that's going to be a tough one. That's a real tough one. Um, I, I've, I've personally committed in my when I teach a semester on data analysis to the Feltron project, which hopefully someone can go to my blog and, and track that link down. Um, and and that is where students, you know, commit to data analysis on on their own lives. They select you know, four variables from their lives to track for a month and then they, um, they run that, those data through all the same analyses that, that we did during the, during the semester. And Ralston Smith asks, I know your concentration is math, but do you know about other resources that help with teaching critical thinking in general? Uh, for for a general discipline, that, I mean that's tough. Um, I, I I just really love the, the last examples for like for like ELA. Um, I love thinking about you know why was the comma invented? What problem was the the, was the comma set out to resolve? Um, that that's a, a very fruitful question for me to to ask and answer about math. Like why do we why do we need to know you know about annuli about an annulus what what problem does that resolve? Like linear equations was quote invented unquote to resolve the the, the weaknesses of proportions, uh, that sort of thing. So as a, that's a question I think you can probably consider in other disciplines besides math. But I, I'm I'm not going to stretch myself that far to you know uh, represent myself as an as an expert in other disciplines. And John asks, how do you want teachers to start making the shift of the problem-solving approach and um, using other people's problems or repurposing their technical problems? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Like, wh what recommendations would we give to just kind of a generic teacher who wants to, to get started with this? And I, I suppose that would be just to, to find um, to find an example problem from kind of the bank that I've created or that other people have created and, and give it a shot. Um, you can start by, by finding the hook in your own textbook problems. Just pick one that seems, seems good to you and come up with, locate the hook and open with that and then ask yourself, you know, what, what image should I go out and capture that would really, um, that would fundamentally represent 
this hook and maybe while you're capturing that image you take some measurements and write those down and, and then you ask students, you know, what measurements would you need to solve this? And you have the measurements right there. And if you're really feeling ambitious, hopefully you can you can record the answer to that hook. Like we showed you that the ticket roll really did have 2,000 tickets. Um, that would be, this is a somewhat natural process of trying to get math problems to resemble how we solve real problems. I know that you put your curriculum and lessons on your blog for other teachers to download. And what prompted you to go to that extent and making those um, available for people to download? Uh, I can recall the very first one I did was called Graphing Stories, which took me 18 hours to create. It was kind of a video DVD collection of of little vignettes, 15 seconds, where students would kind of graph two variables over over time. You know, um, this is it was really useful for me in class. But I was really bummed that I spent 18 hours that weekend creating it. So I, I put it online in a form that anybody could download and create the DVD. I, I Emailed some. I sent some DVDs via via snail mail to some people, and I was no longer uh, frustrated that I'd spent so much time. You know, like uh, six thousand people downloaded it in two weeks, and if you distribute my eighteen hours over that many classrooms, you know, the, the return on my investment seems seems awesome. Like it's a trivial amount of time for uh, you know a return for six thousand people. So. Um, the other benefit was that in the comments of that post, people were offering me all kinds of suggestions for how to improve it, other vignettes to record. Um, so since then, I think I, I've made it. I've made it my business to be really public about my practice, um, being anonymous about student names, but be, uh, being really public about my ideas and um, about lessons that I try out. And the experience of receiving that criticism um, has been. Just incredibly valuable. Where I, I I don't think it's out of line to suggest that I experienced two years of professional growth for every year I was in the profession when I was blogging. But that was that was how useful um, and and growing the criticism was for me. I can imagine, and that would definitely be very rewarding. Is is that how you became involved with the TED Talk? Yeah, and then I mean, there's the other issue of like people want to know how do you make money from blogging or or whatever, and it's such a strange question, and we're in really strange times right now. But I mean, there is the bit where as people are interested in in helping helping me out with my lessons, and people were starting to profit from my lessons, and then that gradually, you know, my blog hit the radar of of you know some people who were deciding on speakers for the TEDx in New York, and that's how I got contacted for that. And that is an amazing, amazing TED talk, and uh, kind of brought you to the forefront in math instruction. Um, if anybody has a question that they would like to ask, please type it in the chat or click on the hand with the green up arrow, and we'll give you the mic. And Jaliza asks, do you have Photoshop? Do you have to Photoshop some of the pictures? Yeah, and the two tools that I, I haven't discussed here that I use extensively are Adobe Photoshop, uh, three tools, Adobe Photoshop, Final Cut Pro, and Adobe After Effects. So I have some background in, in video editing and graphic design, and that has paid off enormous dividends in terms of math curriculum construction. Not necessary to start with this at all, but it does allow for some, some interesting problems that you can't do otherwise. And Bill asks an interesting question. Have you developed questions to ask yourself when developing a problem or a, kind, a sort of template outline for teachers? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I'm not sure I, I, I fully understand it, but I'll, I'll give a shot that you know, I ask myself, why would anybody care? Like, is, the, is there a perplexing question here that the image asks for inherently? Um, and then, yeah, what information would I need to solve that? I, I ask myself the same questions I ask students basically, and if the, flow, if the problem solving flow feels natural, then I continue. If the problem solving flow is 
is, is slow and if I as the teacher have to really push the water forward on that, so to speak, then I know I'm, I'm on the wrong track. And in addition to that, um, in addition to that um, there, another type of tool, in addition to these real world problems, is do your lessons include a skill based practice? Yeah, definitely. I don't want to give the impression that this is what I do every single day. This is something that would happen, you know, on different levels. There's different sizes and, and commitments to these kind of problems, time commitments. But we would do this on average once every week, or I mean once every two weeks, once every week, week and a half. Um, but yeah, there, there is, there are times where like, like polynomials, how do you factor a polynomial? Like how do you, what is the photo that evokes factoring polynomials? And maybe say algebra tiles, I don't know, it's not the same thing though. But because we invest in our community and cultural values of curiosity and charging hard at new problems, because we've done that, when it comes time to, to teach polynomials, all I, all I do is take a problem they've seen and know how to do and I make a subtle change to it. So they know how to factor polynomials or trinomials that have the, the first coefficient being one. I change it to a two. And that small change then I say, all right, let's, let's see you work on this. Who can factor this? And it's not this, this de distressing thing where students need to know the formula or, or how to do it and they, you know, they kind of lose their minds if you haven't taught them how to do it first. And, and watching them try to solve it, I then can, can make n certain nudges. Like I can, I can say, oh, this is awesome. You got this part right. Keep that. Um, try it again. Check your answer. And the students aren't frustrated by that because we've done these, these more sporadic but really involving um, problem solving kind of adventures. And that, that's an interesting point on the adventure. Um, Nate asks, do you use a, do you use a WCY do DWP? And that's, if you're new to Stanford Law, that's Stanford, what could you do with the type of problem during every class? And what does a typical class period look like for your student? Yeah, I mean, like I said, these, these what can you do with this problems, these perplexing problems, typically once every week and a half, and there's different sizes. So the, the Gatorade problem I mentioned uh, that you saw, that's a much quicker one that we might do for an opener. But on the, on the opener, assuming this is an average day where we have a skill to learn, the opener will, involve, will, will revolve around the skill that we just learned, the skill that students feel proficient in. And then the hook of the lesson even though it's not a hook in the, in the kind of real world application sense, the hook will be to just tweak that skill slightly. So in, in the case I just mentioned, you know, just to tweak that coefficient so it's no longer simple in one and to make it two and then to have students work on it. So the structure kind of has a, has a translation to skill problems, though it's not exact. And Bill asks, do you always have some kind of summary talk at the end of your lessons and activities, and what would that look like? Yeah, great question from Bill there. And I, sh I kind of neglected that part, but yeah, we do have a wrap up. We have to, and and what that is 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 where I'm I'm basically acting as someone who summarizes the the, the results of their research and experimentation. So, you know, I don't define the, the formula for area of an annulus at the start of the lesson, but what I do is at the end say, all right, so how did you, how did you find the area of this thing? And as they're explaining it to me, I'm, I'm kind of translating what they're telling me into that formula. And so I, I provide kind of the, the mathematical summary. Or if they've invented terminology for the annulus, um, you know, donut looking thingy or whatever, uh, I, I, I might mention that math, math, people who, who use mathematics for a living, they call it an annulus, or as some folks have mentioned in the comments, maybe I wouldn't mention that because it has all kinds of weird connotations. But the point being <laughs> is that my talk at the end is designed to summarize their research. And that's key for helping the students make those connections. Um, Nick, Nick asks, did you have problems initially with students not doing your openers or working on the problems? Uh, I mean, that, 
Yeah, you, you want to, I suppose, backload the really tough opener problems. You know, the very first opener problem is is the easiest on you know of all of them, so it gets students kind of some momentum building. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm not just sitting at my desk, you know, sipping a latte during that time. I'm walking around, and if a student is having problem uh, difficulty, then you know we try to resolve that as math teachers. And John poses the question, is the main argument against skills focus, is it that skills are obsolete as well as disengaging? Um, no, I'm not, even, I'm not even sure that we're really arguing against skills focus. I mean, some of the skills I think you could argue are obsolete, but ideally our, our, the, the skills we focus on are skills that resolve interesting problems and perhaps even interesting problems from the world around students um, in the best case scenario. But um, we, can, we can turn skills focus into something very interesting, but it's kind of, it depends on how we present it. If we present it by this is how you, saw, this is how you factor a trinomial with coefficient greater than one, now do 10 example problems, um, that is disengaging. But if we say, all right, what can you do with this new thing? Like, try some stuff out here that is is less disengaging. Definitely, and I recommend that everybody subscribe and uh, look through Dan's blog. If Dan has fantastic resources, you can also. You can uh, subscribe to our blog of the resources on our archive and recording page. Those entries are basically blog entries. And our website, I just put in, is live.classroom20.com. And Carol asks, are there any thoughts for students that have been unsuccessful at math for 12 years and now they suddenly realize they need it for life or for their jobs and careers? And that, that's a that's a tough one right there. Yeah, I mean, I would I suppose I would recommend that you jump back to a remedial level. There's lots of interesting online options these days for students who want to remediate. I would I would certainly find an online class and not a class where you're with students who are not your same age peer uh, because that could that could have a pretty demoralizing effect. But online, you could control the pace of your own instruction. Yeah, that's a good point about the, the remedial and the, the self-esteem issue. That's a critical component. Joe was uh, mentioning, are we thinking of having students go to problems together over a period of time and doing this using postings on a class blog? What are your thoughts on making a class blog work and be engaging for students? Yeah, I think, I think you, you, that question is best directed at Darren Kuropatwa. As they say his name. He's done a lot of work with classroom blogs. Um, I, I, I haven't. I find that the equity is tech equity is a huge issue. Like what students are able to access the blog and post to the blog, and do we give them time in class to post to the blog? Um, but he has had some interesting successes with that. I'll put his I'll put his link in the in the comments. Yes, Darren has. Um, yes, Darren has um, I've, if I recall, he has students. That we lost our moderator. I'll, yes, I'll grab some, sorry. some questions here. I <laughs> I, was, I pulled the Lord. I thought my mic was on. Uh, what I was saying was, um, Dan, I believe that Darren's blog. If you have students that record the minutes or the notes from his uh, lectures, is that correct? Is he the one I'm thinking of? Yeah, yeah, I think you have that right. He, he uses a, a whiteboard, an interactive whiteboard, and. Um, you know, has students save the notes off of that and um, post them along with some comments. So that, that's certainly interesting. I don't know. I, I would be interested to know what that, you know, what the, actually the effect of that is on student achievements. Uh, I, I'm certain it would have some interesting effects on student engagement and disposition towards math. Well, he mentioned that it's effective. It's, it's very effective for those students that miss the class for some reason. 
but he said there also became a competition to outdo one another to create better, more detailed notes. With um, and students went to the extent of adding in their own um, kind of infographics that are reflective of the session, and they really went above and beyond just taking the typical notes. They put in their own perceptions and interpretations in addition to the concepts that he was teaching. So it really extended the learning for everybody, not just the one who's taking the notes that week. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. And Kathleen asked um, about the con con. Um, Khan Academy math. Yeah, is everybody familiar with Khan Academy? I can throw a link to that site. Khan, uh, saw Khan is the newest, biggest thing, uh, funding from Google and Bill Gates these days. And uh, yeah, it's it's really interesting. He's he's got a lot of videos that explain concepts in a very clear. Very, you know, he's an engaging speaker, um, and he's got a lot of those, a lot of those videos. Um, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure to what extent those videos will will persuade a student um, to love math, to engage oneself in math. If that student already isn't isn't already engaged in math, that, if that student comes to the table wanting to learn how to how to factor trinomials, um, I think. Those Solid Cons videos will be very helpful. I'm curious what we can do um, to engage students in the relevance of math also though. And there are a lot of resources for teachers to use for the short clips and the, the short videos uh, for tutorials. Tim Falberg was one of our guests and he does a lot of work where students create math caps, which is essentially a screen cast or a pen cast. Um, Clarifying and extending or explaining is a math concept. And there's Teachers TV, of course, Teachers too, but there are a lot of math resources out there. And we've included several in our GLAM link. And I'm going to get that link for us. And if there are questions that we have not addressed, please type them in the chat. Or if you'd like to use your mic, you're welcome to do so. Click on the hand with the green up barrel. And we'll give you the mic to do that. And are there any last questions before we let... Okay. Any suggestions, Dan, for having students build their own questions? Yeah. Uh, that is really the the gold medal here for a teacher, I suppose. Um, I I've not done enough work with that. If you, I, I know this though that the, the practice of asking students what question do you have about this image will be the one question you'd want to the answer to before you walked away today. Um, that is good practice for having students come up with their own questions about the world around them. And you know, if you're just doing textbook problems where the, where, the, where the question is given to you and you you, know, you answer it because you're ha you have to, I think that that distances students from the practice that Bill is after here. Um, I, ideally, that, that might be a good year-end summary. Come up with a question just like the kind that we've been we've been working on. That's a good point about the summary. Idra um, Dinsky. Posing perplexing, perplexing problems seems to go against the idea of scaffolding questions to help students navigate their problem. And, and they wonder if you're when you are scaffolding as you go around the classroom, are you scaffolding as you direct the student investigation? Yeah, good question. Um, I think the scaffolding is really important for reasons mentioned. I just don't want to give a student a scaffold that the student doesn't need. And if it's possible for the student to construct her own scaffold, I definitely don't want to take that that skill away from her. That's a that that'd be making the the problem less cognitively demanding um, by scaffolding, giving the student scaffolds that she doesn't need. Um, so that said, yeah, when I'm walking around, if a student is at a place where the student can't get any higher in the problem, I'm going to offer the student a scaffold, hopefully in the form of a question that gets the student to see the need for that particular scaffold. Oh, that's a great point. Great point. 
um, I know that I know Rex and Hurley Rex has, um, has um, a site next to this to dot org. I can't remember where he has, uh, he has some videos as well on that. Map is his mentioning mapstream dot tv for some additional resources. And that's our glam link for the day. He has has Dan's TED Talk and blog and some other great resources associated with math for you to follow up with and explore those resources. And are there any last questions or comments that you'd like to make before we let Dan go? If so, you can type your question in the chat or click on the hand with the green up arrow. And and it looks like we has Martin asking, has anybody used the privileges? I'm not sure which privileges you're referring to, Martin. If you want to type that in the chat. And Dan, if you put in your Twitter and your email address, and let me find that slide. Thank you. Uh, Martin's talking about anyone abuse the privileges or selection of the math problems. Is that what you're referring to, Martin? Suggesting or making inappropriate comments? I'm not, not exactly clear on the question. Dan, have you had any students that have uh, crossed the line or suggested something inappropriate or posed an inappropriate math problem? Anything along those lines? Um, not not typically. I mean, the same norms that govern class discussions in general, like don't be disrespectful of other people or yourself, that sort of thing, still applies when I'm asking them what questions they want to know. Um, some of them could be you know, out of left field, uh, which is fine. We take those in stride and try to focus on the one that most students have asked. That's a great approach. And Sue, I definitely agree that it is great to talk with people excited about math and math education. I'm definitely one of those. And I've taught middle school math, and if I were to go back in the classroom, I would definitely go into sixth grade math. Well, it looks like we've come to a conclusion. The questions have stopped coming in. So we're going to let Dan go and enjoy the rest of his weekend. And the website where we're going to post our recording to Dan is live.classroom20.com. Great. Thanks, everybody, and for, on the for showing whiteboard, up and for pushing my Dan's contact here. information. And thank you so much, Dan. We really appreciate you joining us today, as well as each and everybody who contributed to today's conversation and to Tammy Moore for the closed captioning feature. This has been a fantastic session. And next Saturday, we're going to continue the and talking about teaching generation text and using cell phones in a very innovative way. So we encourage you to join us next Saturday at this same time, 12 p.m. Eastern. And we look forward to seeing you online. And don't forget the Global Education Conference that Steve Hargadon is co-chairing will be the 15th through the 19th. And uh, we're looking to some fantastic presentations. Uh, in two weeks. So thank you again, Dan, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Thanks, everybody. Bye.